Welcome, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here today at TK Forum 2021. It is a great honor for me to present at uh, this prestigious forum and welcoming all our distinguished guests here with us today. So my name is Crystal Lim Lange, and I am the CEO and uh, co-founder of Forest Wolf. Uh, we are a uh, company that specializes in unlocking human potential. And my career has, um, for the past decade or so, has been all about unlocking deep human potential of our youth, of our talent in the workforce. Um, prior to establishing Forest Wolf, I was actually the founding director of the National University of Singapore's Center for Future Ready Graduates. And that was an, um, an, a center where we looked at how to prepare Singapore's university youth for the brave new world that they were going to meet after they graduated from university. We all know that the world that we're going into is very, very different from the world uh, of just 10 years ago, or the world of when we were, uh, you know, speaking of people my age, going out into the, the real world looking for jobs. The whole landscape of jobs has changed drastically. So in today's presentation, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the factors that we need to understand so that we can prepare ourselves as educators as well as our youth for the future of work. I'm also going to be talking about not just the skills that we need, but the mindsets that we need as well. Um, and also, I'm going to be talking about uh, my uh, latest book, Deep Human, uh, which covers some of the essential five essential super skills that you need that, uh, in order for you to lead a happy, successful and meaningful life in the age of disruption. OK, so I'm going to share my screen with you now. So. I want to ask you all a question first, and you can think about the answer. I want to ask you, does higher education, does university, do you think it prepares graduates in Thailand effectively for the future? So what do you think? Do you think yes or no? I'm going to show you what the research suggests in a moment. So I hope you've got your answer with you. So hold it in your mind. Let's go and see what... Uh, uh, two different groups of people answered. Firstly, research that was carried out by Gallup in uh, just about five or six years ago, uh, they asked this question to thousands of uh, chief academic officers at universities. And uh, most of the senior management that they asked, 96% of them said, yes, of course we do. Of course, universities prepare students for the workplace. But then when Gallup went about and asked thousands of employers, what do you think? Employers, actually, only 11% of employers agreed with them. So that is a big gap. Most people in higher education, educators, who tend to be a little bit biased. We tend to think, yes, we're doing a good job, or at least you know, we, we're doing as much as we can. But, you know, this data was, was taken about six years ago. And my hunch was is that if they we did this survey in the workplace right now in the middle of COVID-19, I think the percentage of employers that actually agree that, that universities in general do a good job of preparing students is probably going to come down from 11%, even less than 10%. So this is what we're calling the skills gap. Um, in the past, uh, you see this ladder over here. This is a picture of a library with lots of books. And there's a ladder over here on the left-hand side of this photo. Um, I like this photo because it illustrates how we used to think of getting a job and a career. So it used to be you study hard. Our parents told us just study hard and then you get a good job. If you have good grades, you get a good job. You start at the bottom of the ladder and then you climb up and up and up the ladder. And with every year you work harder, you study harder and you are bound to climb the ladder of success. Now, what we know is that in today's world, a career looks more like this. It's no longer a ladder. It's like an obstacle course. It's like a jungle gym where you're not just going up 
rung by rung, you may have to go sideways because maybe this ladder stopped. Maybe this job got disrupted. Maybe the job doesn't exist anymore. Maybe I have to swing to the left and grab another branch. Maybe I, after I try this out, I discover, oh, that's not, not for me or market conditions change. Maybe I need to swing to the other side and try something new. So in the brave new world that we are going to, all of us, including educators, it's about the lateral movements. It's about going broad. It's about trying new things rather than staying you know, stuck in where you are on the same ladder and just looking upwards and climbing the vertical ladder. So in the brave new world, we need to really get a lot more creative uh, about how we think of our career. We need to try many different new approaches. We need to expose ourselves to many different kinds of experiences. For example, students uh, doing very different uh, internships. If you are an engineering student, rather than just doing engineering internships, you think about your uh, education as an opportunity for you to do three or four, even four internships. Uh, and maybe one of them can be engineering. Maybe another one of them should be in something very different like graphic design or UX or uh, something to do with the arts, for example. Because what we know is that if we don't know what the jobs of the future are, and nobody knows because the world is changing so fast, the best strategy is actually to learn a lot of very broad skills in different areas and expose ourselves to diverse experiences so that no matter how much the world of uh, the landscape of jobs changes, we can always find some way to be relevant. So we are living in what we call a VUCA world. Uh, many of you may or may not have heard the, the term VUCA. VUCA stands for a situation that is volatile, that is uncertain, that is complex, very complicated, and that is ambiguous. You don't know which direction to go. So when I wrote uh, my book, Deep Human, with my partner, Dr. Gregor Lange, uh, Lim Lange, we actually were already going through a VUCA world because of artificial intelligence, right? Uh, but we never knew about COVID-19. We never knew this pandemic was going to come. And uh, now we are living in a world that's even <clears throat> much more VUCA than we anticipated. And what we do know about the future of work we're all going to be living longer, hopefully, you know, if the vaccines work, <laughs> I think they will. But in general, we are going to be living longer because of advances in medical technology. Uh, those of us uh, in the work starting, uh, starting our careers today, we're going to be working for much longer, maybe even 70 years of your life is going to be spent working because um, most of humanity is going to be living a lot longer. So the question is, how do we find work that is meaningful? And if we're living so long, it cannot be that education is we go to university once at 18 years old, and then after we study for three years, okay, I'm done. I never have to study again. Uh, it's not the case because if we're working for 70 years, everything that you've learned when you were 20 years old it's going to be so outdated. It's going to be so obsolete. In fact, in Singapore, uh, most of the employers are saying that even by the time you graduate from university, everything that you've learned is pretty much obsolete. So what doesn't become obsolete, what is still relevant is uh, the timeless soft skills, the social, emotional skills that you pick up, the deep human skills, like how to think critically, how to think creatively, how do you actually communicate and interact with other people. But the stuff, the hard skills that you learn, the things like you know, even coding, uh, what kind of software that you're using, the technical skills, all of those will go obsolete very, very fast. So we know that there's going to be massive job disruption as well. We already see it going on um, and it's getting even faster because of COVID. And we know that there is this uh, epidemic of stress, anxiety, depression, disconnection, particularly in our youth. We are seeing data that suggests that our youth have never been lonelier, 
and more disconnected. They may have 1,000 friends on Facebook, but you ask them, do you feel connected? And most of them say, no, I feel alone. I feel very lonely. So social media is also creating uh, this sort of phenomenon where everyone is connected, but we are together alone. So uh, we need to also understand how do we actually support our youth and the deep human skills I'm going to talk about are also key in helping our youth really function because there's no point installing all the best teaching and learning into our youth if they are so uh, depressed or anxious or don't have self-confidence, even the best education you give them, it's not going to make a difference uh, because uh, they can't function and, uh, well and they don't have emotional and mental well-being. So that's the foundation of uh, a good education as well. If you can't focus, if you can't concentrate, if you don't have self-confidence, uh, it, uh, it doesn't set you up for success. So, and then, uh, of course, we have this question of deep tech versus deep human. Uh, by that, I mean that we're spending a lot of time focusing on technology, tech, um, technological advances in the world outside. Um, but I think it's sometimes we forget about the technology inside us. So, for instance, um, when was the last time you upgraded the way you thought? What, when was the last time you upgraded your internal software, your beliefs about yourself, your mindsets about the world? A lot of times we have these beliefs that originate in childhood. Maybe our parents told us certain messages like, oh, you're just very shy or you know, you're not smart or you're not good enough. Or maybe our teachers gave us these messages. And a lot of times like the beliefs that we acquire in childhood, we don't challenge them. We just carry them along with us and we don't kind of upgrade these beliefs. And as we grow up and we go through life, we still carry these old beliefs like, oh, I'm not smart at this. I'm not good at uh, speaking English. Oh, I'm just not a confident person. And these internal beliefs is kind of like the internal operating system that is behind, uh, always operating in the background and actually holding us back from our true potential. So that's also a really, uh, you know, um, really big concern. So we know from uh, data that automation uh, is a big trend. Uh, we know, especially with COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, governments, companies, they are trying to automate more, not less, uh, because automation, uh, you know, is uh, you don't have to, uh, you, robots are not affected by the pandemic. Uh, people are ordering more, uh, you know, remotely, they're working more remotely. And we know automation as well, it, it's going to create a lot of job displacement. So World Economic Forum thinks that, you know, at least 75 million jobs are going to be displaced by automation by 2022. But it's also going to create a lot of new jobs. So there's going to be a lot of disruption with jobs disappearing, jobs appearing, not knowing what the new jobs are, etc. New markets such as cryptocurrencies, for example, uh, bursting up uh, as, as we speak. So, um, and, and at the same time, the traditional companies, your traditional big name companies, whether it's like your General Electric or your uh, Ford or Toyota, whatever it is, uh, you know, um, we know that 40% of, of these big companies in the world, they probably won't exist by 2025. You think about uh, all of the very big brands, many of them, uh, like Kodak, for example, Kodak doesn't exist today. When I was growing up, Every few meters, you could see like, uh, you know, when you're driving along, you could see Kodak billboards everywhere. Uh, other companies like BlackBerry, for example, for when I was in the workforce, starting up my career, all of us were addicted to our Blackberries. We were all the time, low Blackberrying away, you know, using our Blackberries for email. Uh, and what happened to Blackberry? 
it went bankrupt because it couldn't innovate. So we see a lot of examples of very, very big companies that you know people uh, really are youth uh, wanting to work for. They think this is a st stable career, a good rice bowl. But in the end, uh, we know the data suggests that a lot of these companies are not going to be around. So we can't always depend on our employer to take care of us for our life. As long as we you know, work hard, we'll always have a good job. We have to look out for ourselves. We have to make sure that we have insurance, that we have really good foundation of skills and mindsets that really serve us well so that if we need to change jobs, if we want to change direction, so we have a lot more options. So I like this quote from the uh, ex-CEO of General Electric, Jack Welch. And what he said is that if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, then the end is near. And what it means is that, you know, we spend a lot of time focusing on the rate of change on the outside, how fast the world is changing, the drones, the AI, all the technology, the pandemic. But we also need to pay attention, like I said, to the rate of change on the inside. How fast are we ourselves skilling up? How fast are we changing our mindsets, our skills, our beliefs so that we can keep pace on the, to the world on the outside? Don't forget the world on the inside. And that is what the education, real education should be about. It should be about giving you the skills and the mindsets to be a lifelong learner so that you're always self-aware, you're always changing yourself to keep pace with the world outside. Um, so a few more statistics. Um, 20, the, this is the skills outlook from the World Economic Forum. Um, we know that these skills on the left are the ones that are growing. The skills on the right are the skills that are declining. That means the skills that uh, are no longer so useful. So these are the, actually the skills on the right that are declining are the ones that traditional education, my education, focused a lot on. It was stuff like memorizing. I was a law student. I had to memorize a lot of information from textbooks. I had to read a lot. And, you know, I studied Chinese. And Chinese is a lot of memorization. Uh, there's a uh, there was uh, there's a lot of these skills like reading, writing, maths, active lis uh, listening. These are, well, I think active listening is still important, but reading, writing, maths. These are things that robots, uh, that AI, that machines can do very well. So, what are the skills that are growing in importance? These are the skills that machines find very hard to do. Um, because what separates you from robots is really these, what we call these higher order skills. Because anything that can be done by a robot will not be considered so valuable in the workplace. Um, if a company can easily get uh, a robot or software to do certain functions, it, over the next few years, humans will not be required to do those functions. That means the relevance for us human beings in the workplace must be those skills that are very hard for machines to do, which is why we call them deep human skills. These are things like, you know, being able to think very deeply and critically, analytical thinking, innovation is a very high order thinking skill, creativity, uh, emotional intelligence, uh, leadership and influencing others, uh, you know, complex problem solving, complex communication. Uh, these are all uh, deep human skills. Most of them on this uh, left-hand side of the page are to do with emotional intelligence and critical thinking. So um, what I want to focus on today, is, uh, oh, I also want to show you this interesting chart, which is about jobs of the future. So you I want to show you the first axis over here. Now imagine uh, all the jobs in the world can be put on this page and organized according to uh, two axes. The first axis is optimization versus creativity and strategy. So optimization means if your job is about basically analyze, uh, looking at data, 
and looking at how to optimize two variables, right? Using data to come up with a, a simple kind of answer, uh, then that your that job would be more of a job that is along this end of the spectrum about optimization. But jobs uh, along this side of the, the spectrum is jobs that require more creativity and strategy. For example, um, advertising, for example, or, uh, you know, being a CEO of a company. So what we know is that in the future, these jobs will be done by AI and robots. These jobs over here will be done by human beings because robots are not so good at creativity and strategy. Now, let me show you another axis. It's low EQ or low compassion or low caring versus high caring. So for example, a job that requires high EQ or high caring could be like a nurse or uh, somebody who's a caretaker for old people. You need to care. You need to have good social emotional skills and emotional intelligence. A job that has low EQ is maybe like uh, I'm working alone as a, a you know, shift operator operating machinery. There's no one around me. There's only machines and I don't need to have good people skills. I don't need to care about other human beings so much. Okay. So what we also know is that in the future, the jobs that don't require EQ, don't require care, caring or love will be more likely to be done by robots. And the ones that require more human, caring, emotional intelligence are more likely to be done by humans. So what does that mean? I want to show you, firstly, if you're, the jobs that are low EQ and require an optimization mostly will be done purely by AI. All these jobs are going to disappear. All these jobs are going to be gone. Okay, then over here we have still low EQ, but higher on creativity and strategy. So these are going to be this circle over here, which represents all the jobs in this quadrant towards they're going to be split. Half of these jobs are going to be done by AI. So, um, for example, um, if uh, now there is um, a software called Canva. I use it for making my <clears throat> flyers, graphic design. And so it's a little bit creative because, you know, uh, but it is also, uh, it can be done by AI because like it's not super creative. It's just basically making a brochure or a web page and you can use AI to do some of it. Okay. But of course, if you are uh, looking at jobs that are highly creative and strategic, for example, I want to launch my new product and I need a, you know, that creative director to tell me what should be my strategy, right? That's going to be done by a combination of humans and AI. AI might be helping us collect data, but the humans will be needed for their creativity. Okay, so let's move on to the sectors which are high EQ. Over here, we have this sector, uh, which looks a little bit like uh, a donut. Uh, this is the sector which is high EQ, but relies on optimization. Okay, so uh, over here, it is, for example, a doctor. Okay, so if you are a doctor, you need to uh, look at a lot of data, right? You need to look at the person's x-ray, you need to look at the blood test, you need to look at a lot of the data. However, uh, even though you have, uh, uh, you, you see in the middle, there's this blue center, uh, it's like you are powered by an AI core. However, you need also to have the human interface. So if I'm a doctor and I look at the chart and I look at the data and I go, oh no, this, my patient has cancer, right? I need to communicate to my patient now uh, and the patient is sitting in front of me. I can't just like give the data here. Just look at this, read it for yourself, right? I need to be a human. I need to wrap it with the human interface. So I need to be able to say, hey, look, I've got the data here. But first of all, I want to reassure you. I want to give you some comfort. I want to let you know that there is hope. Uh, this is not uh, as bad as it seems. 
I need to be able to have the human interface. Yeah. So that is this sector, optimization and high EQ sectors like doctors, for example. Um, and then lastly, we have um, this sector over here, which is high EQ and also highly creative. For example, CEO. For example, teacher, educators, we are in this sector. You need to love your students. If you don't love your students, you know, there's no point being a teacher. And the best students, uh, teachers are the ones that really care about their students. Um, so, and also as a teacher, you, as an educator, you need to be creative. You need to be quite strategic. You need to always see, oh, uh, how can I change my lesson plan? Or maybe this person, or maybe COVID happened and I need to change everything and how I, how I do things, different activities, different learning points. Yeah, so um, I want to show you the, in the next slide, these are some of the jobs that map on to the various sectors. <clears throat> As you can see over here, uh, CEO, uh, social worker, PR marketing director, this sector, the jobs will remain stable for a long time. Yeah, because they are very hard to be done by machinery. I would even put like professor up here, high, uh, university educators. Uh, you know, if you're good at university educator, you should be up here. Um, over here, um, high EQ, but more regard, uh, more working with, uh, with, uh, with optimization would be things like uh, wedding planner. It's kind of a little bit more routine, but you still need to care about people like, uh, you know, uh, elderly companion, uh, tour guide, for example. And then the ones that are going to be gone, the sector that you really want to stay away from, like tele, uh, are things like dishwasher. You've got machines to do that, uh, tele sales, customer support, even radiologists. Uh, AI now can analyze all of the x rays or better than a human being, for example. Security guards, truck drivers. We all know self driving cars, everything. All the AI is going to remove all of these jobs over here. So we want to be, in general, what my advice is, is we want to be uh, with, you can make any job more stable by moving up in EQ. So for example, let's say I am a research analyst over here. Maybe I'm a person that specializes in research. So it's creative and strategic, but at normally the job doesn't require so much EQ. However, I have also seen researchers who are very, very good at EQ. And then what they do is that they are able to publish their research pieces. They are able to go on a road show and travel around, you know, this is before COVID or, um, or do public speaking and really uh, be able to uh, connect their work better with other people, present, communicate better. And that moves them from this zone up into the safe zone. So you can, the, the point of this slide is any job that you're doing, any career that you're doing, you can make it more stable. You can make your chances of uh, surviving and thriving better if you get more creative and move in this direction or if you have more uh, EQ and better human skills. Okay, so... Uh, with these four zones, there's uh, this graph actually comes from AI special uh, specialist Kai Fu Li. He was an amazing AI, he is an amazing AI expert, Kai Fu Li. I highly recommend his books. Uh, it's called AI Superpower. And uh, he calls this sector over here the danger zone. Over here, uh, the one with like the donut is called the human veneer, where you're powered by AI, but you need a human uh, veneer coating. Over here, this one that we want to be is called the safe zone. And over here, this one where it's half AI and half human plus AI is called the slow creep. The jobs will creep the, gradually more and more of them will be done by AI. So I hope this, this gives you a good overview about the trend of jobs of the future. Uh, this is a quote from the World Economic Forum. They say human skills will increase, retain or increase their value. So will attention to details, resilience, flexibility and complex problem solving. So emotional intelligence, leadership and social influence and service orientation. Service orientations, remember again, the caring, the EQ, that, that is also set to see particular increase in demand. In a world where we never have so many 
anxious, lonely, depressed people, especially after COVID, a lot of people struggling with mental health. Uh, we are going to see a lot of increase in jobs that can actually help people feel better, operate better. Okay, so uh, we're getting now to the skills level. In the future of deep tech, we need to double down. That means we need to pay more attention to our deep human skills as we've seen in order to really have good jobs, good careers in the future. So I've identified in my book, Deep Human, five super skills that are super, super important. And these skills, you will, they will not change. They will not become obsolete. Uh, they are always timeless. And no matter how much the world changes, you, they will always be in demand. So the first skill is focus and insight because we are living in a world of distractions. Yeah, we've never had so many distractions, the smartphones, we have uh, now when we are on our computer, we have so many different windows open all the time. We know that the average uh, attention span has really decreased very significantly. We see in our students today as educators, how hard it is to get them to read a book. They are so used to watching YouTube videos, now even TikTok is like a few seconds only for them to be able to sit still and actually focus and not be distracted is very really hard. And when I was uh, working at, the at a university, I remember every year we would get senior management telling us, oh, the lesson needs to be shorter. The, the video needs to be shorter. We used to be asked to make 10 minute videos or 20 minute videos. Then the next year was, okay, we need to cut to 10 minute videos. And then the next year was, eight minute videos. And I was saying, well, rather than, well, you know, in a few years time, maybe it's going to be TikTok, <laughs> 30 second videos for us to learn science or whatever it is. It's not possible. So there's two approaches. Either we can keep on trying to make our learning shorter and shorter and more bite-sized, or we can train our students to lengthen their focus and attention span. And I prefer to train our students to focus better. So one important technique for how to focus better is mindfulness. And um, mindfulness is uh, basically brain training. And sometimes in Asia, in Thailand, in, as, in Singapore, for example, people get a little bit confused between mindfulness and meditation. They might think that, oh, isn't that like what I go to the temple to do? I pray, I meditate. So when I say mindfulness, it's a little bit different from the Buddhist sort of meditation. How we actually train our students is non-religious mindfulness, secular mindfulness, which is basically active noticing. It is practicing how to focus your attention on a single uh, object of attention and then to basically notice right to be basically be able to notice more things in the present moment so the first super skill really is focus and insight and that's going to be very important because we are living in a world of distractions and even like it, when we are living in the COVID-19 pandemic world uh, the natural tendency of the brain is to focus on negative news so like you know you pick up the newspaper or you go on the internet uh, if you are shown a newspaper and there's bad things and there's good things, your brain will naturally go to the negative things. It's the natural negative bias of our brain. So it's also important to, to learn how to control our brain's focus because what we focus on will determine our future. Like it's what Gandhi said. Gandhi once said, uh, your thoughts or your focus becomes your beliefs. Your beliefs become your actions. Your actions become your habits and your habits become your destiny. So it all starts with what are you going to focus on? If you're only going to focus on the bad things today, oh, COVID-19, worrying about all the things I can't control, thinking about what's going to happen to this and that and focusing, oh, I'm not good enough, all the negative things, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. That means you think it and it's going to become true. 
On the other hand, if you manage to control your focus and focus on the, the positive things, right? What is the good stuff that's happening? What are my strengths that I have? What are the experiences that I can bring to the table? Focus on the positive influences in my life. What can I be grateful for? That's going to set me up for success. That's going to make me more confident. That's going to, in an interview, it's going to make me, you know, uh, more likely to get chosen at work. It's going to be able to, you know, uh, make me a better communicator and a more positive person to be around. More people want to hang around me versus somebody who is negative, who's always depressed, right? So um, focus is super important. Secondly, um, the second deep human skill is self-awareness. So self-awareness is like a mirror. How clearly do I see myself? How clearly do I know my strengths so that I can take advantage of my strengths, but also my weaknesses so that I can uh, learn new ways of developing and growing? <clears throat> uh, self-awareness is very, very important because in the world of the future, we need to be able to uh, keep track of how we need to grow, how we need to change, how we need to adapt. And a lot of uh, times, uh, self-awareness, uh, a lot of people think that they know themselves, that they know how they come across to the world. But a lot of research suggests that most people are actually very low level of self-awareness. So we need to improve our level of self-awareness by reflection, by all, but also asking other people, getting feedback from other people. You know, in my presentation, how did you think I could improve? Always getting feedback from other people. The third deep human super skill is empathy and compassion. How do you actually connect deeper to other people? How do you actually um, see the world, not just from your point of view, but from other people's point of view. So practicing putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Um, we think that jobs uh, that require empathy are going to be around for a very long time because human beings always want to deal, uh, always want to trust another human being. Being able to create trust, being able to make another human being trust you, that is something that only humans can do. Yeah, so that is very, very important to understand how to actually connect deeper to another person. The fourth super skill is complex communication. Uh, and that means being able to have a difficult conversation with somebody to be able to resolve conflict. For example, if two people are arguing, can you actually smooth out the situation to be able to influence other people? This complex communication is going to become very, very important, particularly as we are working remotely. Everyone is having Zoom meetings like me with you now. You know, it's very hard to communicate over Zoom uh, because you don't have so much data. Uh, you cannot feel the person's energy so much. Sometimes it's hard to read, to understand how they're actually feeling, what they mean. Uh, it's very easy to misunderstand people when we are working remotely. So the communication skills need to be even better. Like if you're on Zoom, your facial expressions, how you, you know, emote, it needs to be even more expressive than normally. But if normally you're very poker face, you're just like this, you just communicate like this. It's very hard for people to understand you, especially in, in the world of remote work. Uh, lastly, adaptive resilience is the last deep human super skills. Uh, it is about when life hands you a challenge, when li life knocks you down, can you bounce back? Uh, but it's not just bouncing back, it's bouncing back with learning it's bouncing back with growth. So adaptive resilience is super important because even if you had all the other four skills, if you don't have resilience, if you can't get back up after you fall down, none of the skills will matter. You need to be able to get up and believe in yourself and to be able to adapt so that when you get up, after life punches you, which it does all of us, you get up as a better person, new and improved. You have learned from the failure. That is about growth mindset. It's about understanding that nothing in life is really a failure. Nothing in life is like a really permanent failure. Everything is a growth opportunity. 
if you tried something and it didn't work out, right? It's not that you're a loser, you're a failure. But if you have a growth mindset, it's about saying that, hey, I tried something, it didn't work out, but I've learned something. I've expanded the boundaries of my knowledge. Now my world is bigger because I have learned. And if I didn't try, and if I didn't uh, go out of my comfort zone, I wouldn't be as smart as I am now. And I grow through that sort of learning. So we know that those five skills are important, but learning skills is not enough. Like I said, skills are like the tip of the iceberg. I can send you for a skills training course, but at the end of the day, uh, you won't change because underneath that is your mindset. If you have an unhealthy mindset, a fixed mindset, a mindset uh, you know, uh, that is like, no matter how hard I try, uh, I'm just not somebody, I'm just not good at maths or I'm a bad singer, no matter how much I try to sing uh, or I practice my singing, I'm never going to be a good singer. That's a fixed mindset. So your mindset is very important. It needs to be more of a growth mindset than a fixed mindset. And then lastly, the biggest part of the iceberg in terms of making positive change is your identity. How do you see yourself? Uh, what kind of beliefs do you have about yourself? Which is why we talked about that self-awareness work. Knowing yourself, believing in yourself is very, very important. And that also is a little bit deeper than education. It starts very early on in your childhood through your parenting that shapes a lot of our core identity beliefs. But even if we had a, a less than ideal childhood, even if we had... Um, we uh, even if we had certain uh, you know factors that really led us to be believe that we can't do it when we were younger, we can always change our identity beliefs. We can always work on them, uh, whether it's seeking help from a coach, from a counselor, from you know uh, working on ourselves, uh, re doing reflecting, uh, finding a supportive community of other people that help us see ourselves as uh, uh, you know for our strengths and appreciate our strengths. That part is really really important as well. So I want to talk. About, lastly, I want to talk about three important mind shifts to shift your mindset. The first one is about uh, shifting away from fear of failure to growth mindset. I've already spoken about that. Uh, one practical tool that I want to give you is um, uh, to develop a habit of sharing. As a teacher or as an educator, oftentimes we tell the students, please go off and fail, go and try, but uh, go off and experiment and try different things. But we forget as teachers, as educators, we have to role model this for them. If they never see us failing, if they never see their parents, their teachers, you know, their bosses failing, then actually they don't feel it's safe for them to fail. Because like you are not role modeling it for them. So one tip I will give all teachers is actually to share uh, with your class, with your students, what was my biggest failure or biggest uh, challenge this week? So actually be a real human being. Say, actually, this COVID is tough. I tried this. It didn't work out. That makes it normal for them so that when they fail, they feel... There's nothing wrong with me. My teacher also fails. My parents also fails. Everyone fails. And it's not about failing. It's about getting up. It's about after I fall down, I get up. That's the important part. But there's nothing wrong with me for falling down. Everyone's going to fall down. If we don't actually normalize it and make it safe for people to fall down and for students to see that it's real and it's part and parcel of everyday life, they're going to grow up in this world where they just see like on Instagram or Facebook, they only see the good things. They only see the unreal, they have an unrealistic expectation of what life is. And then whenever they, they face challenges, it's going to make them feel uncomfortable and they want to hide all, uh, you know, the, this discomfort from other people. So I encourage all our educators out there to share your failures, talk about the lessons you learn from them and sh show your students that you are proud of these uh, challenges. You are proud of the learning because that is going to be what helps them understand growth mindset. Yeah. The second mind shift is, 
is in the in the past the old way of thinking is oh let's get the plan right so let uh, when when we need to do something let's spend a lot of time working on the plan uh, how to do it we do it this way then you know we have a lot of meetings in university we have a lot of meetings to decide what to do we have steering committee we have the committee to decide who should be on the steering committee we have the meeting to decide about what should we teach uh, how should we teach it and we have so many so many meetings we have so many meetings to decide what should be the way to go however the world changes so fast it has no time to wait for us to have the perfect plan because once you come up with the perfect plan things will change and you the perfect plan will no longer be perfect you will need to start from scratch uh, from scratch again so rather than as educators wasting too much time trying to come up with the perfect plan the perfect curriculum the perfect you know whatever it is structure the perfect system we actually should basically uh, learn by doing so we, we try many different experiments. We say, well, you know, I don't know what's going to be the perfect uh, plan, but I'm going to try experiment A, B, and C. I'm going to collect data. And what's more important is to get out there and do something. And by doing something, we are going to learn from it. So adapting fast and trying many different ideas than wasting time arguing about what should be the right plan. So one action that I have for all of you educators is to keep a thought experiment list. Keep a list of experiments that you're doing to challenge yourself. So don't just teach the same old thing, the same old way you've always taught it. Maybe you can experiment. I wonder what it's like if I reverse my curriculum. I teach this piece first. Uh, before I teach this other piece. I wonder what it's going to be like if I change my class size. I wonder what it's going to be like if I start my lesson with something different, with a question, which did this problem, rather than teaching them the theory first. So keep on experimenting and exercise your ideas muscle and maybe even involve your students. Come up with brainstorming. Ask them, you know, what would you like to learn? What problems are you struggling with? What would be interesting? So you are a collaborator. You are, uh, you know, a partner with your students not just like somebody high up, you know, giving them all this information and they're down here looking up at you, right? So it's more about partnering with our students. So the last mindset shift I want to talk about is this one. In the old, in the, in the past, uh, we uh, use, in, in, especially in the corporate world, we used to have a much more of a focus on logic, um, on problem solving, uh, so if somebody comes into your office like a student and says, I'm starting, uh, oh, I have this problem. I have something that's really difficult that's going on for me. In the past, as educators, we always start off with problem solving. Oh, what have you tried? Have you tried this? Maybe you should try that. We give advice. When somebody comes to us with a problem, most of us, the number one thing we will do is we will try to give them a solution. It's part of our training. However, we know that a lot of the problems our students are facing uh, cannot be easily solved just by giving advice. A lot of times the problems our students face, actually what they're looking for a lot of the time is really understanding, is really empathy. So if I come to my lecturer and I say, hey, I've got something really difficult to, to, to share with you. I'm really struggling. I'm really struggling at school. If my lecturer says, oh, did you try this? Did you try that? Have you tried this? Whatever. At that point of time, uh, I'm, I may not feel so seen. I may not feel so heard. I may not feel understood. I might actually say, I've already tried all of this. I already tried. You don't get me. However, if my educators look at me and said, hey, Crystal, I really understand. I see you. I hear you what you have to say is very important to me. Tell me more about it. How did you, you know, and, and, and really listens to me, right? Uh, it's going to make me as a student want to share more. It's going to make me want to tell them more. It's going to make me feel understood. And a lot of the times I will tell, I will tell you, students don't so much need to be given solutions. They need to feel as if you see them you hear them, you support them, and you believe in them. And that is even more important 
than just kind of problem solving. And by the way, I'm not saying don't problem solve. It is very important as an uh, educator, you also have to problem solve. But I'm saying there's a sequence in how you do things. If somebody is struggling, the first thing is to connect with them with empathy. The first thing is to make them feel, I understand, I see you, I hear you, you matter to me. And then only after you've listened, you've heard them, you've seen them, then only you can ask them, what would serve you best? How can I best be of service? Would you like me to give you advice? If they say, yes, I want your advice, then you move into problem solving. But don't automatically always go into problem solving before you connect. It's more important to be human first, form the connection, and then move to problem solving. Yeah. So I, I hope um, these uh, you know few points have been useful for you. Uh, the magic formula here, if you don't remember anything else from this presentation, please remember the magic formula. If anybody ever comes to you, uh, and they have something to share that's very important, or if you're in a difficult situation, if somebody's arguing with you, if you don't know what to say with another human being, always remember these three uh, sentences. I see you, I hear you, and what you have to say matters to me. At any point of your life, if anybody is ever angry at you, anybody is quarreling, anybody is frustrated, it is always because they feel you don't see me, you don't hear me, you don't, I don't matter to you. And that is what causes human friction. If you are able to communicate, I see you, I hear you, and what you have to say is important, it allows us to be more human with each other and to have better relationships and also help set, set us up for success. So uh, I've come to the end of my presentation today. I hope that you've learned something about the future of work and uh, how to connect better to yourself and to other people around you and how to set up your students with the deep human skills that they need for this brave new world of work. Thank you very much for joining me and uh, please do connect with me. Uh, I have a website, uh, www.forestwolf, one word, and you can find me on Instagram and also on LinkedIn. I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So look forward to connecting with all of you there. Thank you very much.